Ted Bundy, serial killer, rapist, necrophile, admitted to 30 murders, said his behaviour was too terrible to describe. Pedro Rodriguez Filo cut his father's heart out and ate it. 70 further murders confirmed. Aileen Wernos tortured and killed seven men while working as a prostitute in Florida. Peter Sutcliffe, the Ripper, murdered 13 prostitutes in Yorkshire, England. Louis Garavito raped and murdered over 140 defenseless street children in Colombia. For most people, this kind of behaviour is just unthinkable, unimaginable. But it's not just what these killers do, it's the complete lack of remorse. The humanity's just missing. It's as if they're creatures from some other species. There's a few serial killers in there. But are they literally different from the rest of us? And if so, how are they different? Are they natural born killers? Or are people made into killers by what happens to them in life? Well, neuroscientist Jim Fallon's been researching this question and he's had a few surprises along the way. This is his story. Irving Medical School, California. Jim Fallon was working on adult stem cells for medical research. But in the 1990s, some of his ex-students started bringing him some different brain images to look at, and things changed. So they said, we've got some pictures we want you to look at, and tell us just what you see. And I'm a visual person, so that's what really grabs me. So they're picking, say, oh, pictures, I'm, I'm in. So they had slices of the brain, and it turns out that these guys were criminals, some serial killers. And so it was after they had been convicted, and it was in the penalty phase of the trial, and they said, and of course the, the criminal would want to be then shown that he was organically crazy. That is, his, something was wrong with his brain. And so he, it wasn't me, it was my brain, you know. And, and so to get a lighter sentence, to get off the death penalty. And as the number of these brain images mounted over the years, Fallon thought he was starting to see a pattern. But was he? Part of being a scientist is you fight the natural tendencies to create a story that may or may not be true. So I said, so we do things blindly. And that's what they did. In a blind trial, colleagues sent him 70 MRI scans. Some were from schizophrenics, others from people with depression. Some had no diagnosis. And tucked away were the scans of some serial killers. And with no clues, Fallon successfully picked out the psychopathic killer's brains. And they all had one pattern in common, which was a loss of function in the orbital cortex above the eyes and the temporal lobes, right where the amygdala is, and the part of the what's called the emotional or limbic cortex. And they all had that. The prefrontal cortex is often referred to as the executive function of the brain. It gives us the ability to predict the outcomes of our actions, make moral decisions, control impulses and urges, but above all, feel empathy with other people and therefore structural and functional abnormalities in this part of the brain, particularly in the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, means that the individual has less control of the limbic system that generates primal emotions such as anger and rage, and will therefore become more predisposed to violence. When I saw that, I went, aha, and my research really changed uh, more to that because I said, well, nobody had really known there was a pattern. So I started, so I wrote a paper on it, uh, with the end chapter in the paper called My Two-Year-Old Granddaughter is a Psychopath, <laughs> you know, just to talk about the behavior of not caring. And, and so anyway, I uh, started to give some talks about it, to test it, to vet it to professionals, legal professionals, psychiatrists, and, and all types of professionals, to see if the story made sense. So Jim Fallon was getting to learn quite a lot about psychopaths' brains, but he was about to learn something else. And it didn't come from a fellow professional at an academic conference, but from his own mother at a family barbecue. And she said, I hear you've been giving talks about murders. And I saw this twinkle in her eye because she, whenever she gets the twinkle, I know something's coming. I said, here it comes. She says, you know, your cousin just said there was a book published, just published on your father, her husband, uh, your father's side of the family, the English side. 
The book was Killed Strangely, which documented the murder of Rebecca Cornell by her own son, Thomas Cornell, a direct great-great-grandfather of Fallon. And so it seemed the Cornell family had quite a history of violence. They had produced seven more convicted or alleged murderers, including, most famously, Lizzie Borden, who was convicted and controversially acquitted of murdering her father and stepmother with an axe. And that was a famous case in the United States when we were growing up as kids. We all knew the song about Lizzie Borden who took an axe and gave her mother 40 wax. And when she was done, she gave her father 41. Very famous axe murderess. And she's a cousin of mine. And, and so, um, so I, I just treated this in a very, I thought it was curious. So what? So what? Well, it wasn't long before Jim Fallon found out, so what? It happened he'd got brain images of all his immediate family as controls for a project he was doing on Alzheimer's disease. And one morning in October 2005, just out of curiosity because of what his mother had told him, he thought he'd take a look. And I looked through it, it was normal. Next subject, normal. And it didn't have any names on it, but just code, it was code. All the way down to the bottom, the bottom of the pile, I, see, I pick it up and I say, oh man, this is, it's in the wrong pile. Because the one at the bottom, which was in the bottom of my family scan, supposedly, uh, looked like the worst case of a murderer I had in the other pile. I thought I'd just switch piles. I said, you guys got to go back and check the machine. I said, this is obviously wrong because it looked like, like the worst serial killer brain. But yeah, and they said, no, it's part of your, your family. So I, then we, I said, well, I got to break the code now because this is something's wrong. And I broke the code, and of course it was me. It was, it was a scan. So I kind of, I said, okay, I get the joke. You know, I, you know, I'm studying serial killers, and then I got the brain that looks like that. And so uh, you, can't, you, can't, you can't make this stuff up. You know what I mean? And so the real things that happen in your life are, are really quite strange often. And the fact that there were at least seven murderers in Fallon's family history raises the question of whether aggressive psychopathy might be inherited. Could it be in the genes? Or well, pioneering research in the Netherlands suggested it might be. In 1978, a woman walked into a hospital in Nijmegen asking for help. Most of the men in her family, including several of her brothers and her son, were extraordinarily pathologically aggressive. Geneticist Han Brunner started looking at this family and after 15 years research, thought he might have an answer. All the violent men in the family had one gene missing, a gene that produces an enzyme, MAOA, that helps regulate the neurotransmitters involved in impulse control. And if you have low activity MAOA, you're more likely to be aggressive. And this became popularly known as the warrior gene. And since Brunner's research, neuroscientists have uncovered a number of other genes associated with extreme violence. Now Jim Fallon had his family's DNA as part of the Alzheimer's project, and so he checked them. Everyone came back with normal balanced combinations. Well, everyone except one. One of them was, had all these markers that were really high risk for all this violent stuff. And of course, it turned out to be me again. But it became a little bit more serious because now I had the brain pattern for the PET scans and the EEG pattern, electroencephalograph, but also now the genetics that were very consistent with a, with a, with a really bad news killer, a psychopath, really. There's a long-standing debate in the psychological sciences about the extent to which our behaviour is due to nature, that's biological heredity, or nurture, that's all the things that happen to us in life, our environment, experiences and so on. Now, as a neuroscientist, Jim Fallon was opposed to the prevailing nurture explanations. For him, the origins of psychopathy are inside us, in here. But if his research was right, and he was sure it was, why wasn't he a killer? a uh, Ted Bundy, a uh, Louis Gravato, a uh, Peter Sutcliffe. What was missing? There had to be something else. And uh, when I look back, uh, something, another piece of serendipity uh, occurred. My older brother was born, and then there were four miscarriages my mother had, so every year. By the time it cut to me, I was born and didn't die. Uh, just for being born, I was treated like the, the you know the golden child because they wanted a big family they wanted six kids and everything and I just showed up and so I was naturally like love 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 
but I was really taken care of, and that was the other part of the triangle, I think, that uh, really staved off um, me becoming, um, you know, a bad news character. So for Jim Fallon, there was another set of factors in the origins of psychopathy, and these were environmental. Differences in childhood experiences. Violent and abusive childhoods can be a predictor of violence in later life. But it also seems that loving and stable ones may protect even against the most dangerous genetic inheritance. And so that was the other, the, the key to it. I said, you know, you can offset, you know, really a, a, a bad throw of the dice with genetically in your brain patterns with love and affection. And this led Jim Fallon to rethink some of his long held ideas. Maybe neuroscience didn't have all the answers. To all my colleagues, I was like Mr. Jeans, saying Gen genetics control everything. So it was like the last joke on me. You don't want to go, okay, I was wrong, I was wrong, but I had to say that, it was true. And so that was really a, uh, a very enlightening thing. And so uh, because I was wrong, I really had to study it more. We began by asking whether there really are natural born killers, people who just love killing for the sake of it. And it seems the answer is well, yes and no. Better, I think, to say there are natural born potential killers. First, it seems that an essential ingredient of a psychopathic killer is a neurodevelopmental brain disorder, specifically a lack of activity in the prefrontal cortex. You know, is it possible to have a normal brain and still be like a psychopathic killer? Now, I must say that I, none of the ones I've ever seen were like that. And, 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 and all of them had some damage to orbital cortex and amygdala. It was a very consistent pattern. Secondly, while the idea of a killer gene is a product of crime fiction rather than fact, neuroscientists have uncovered a number of specific alleles, such as a low variant of the MAO gene associated with aggressive and violent behavior. And so Jim Fallon's story shows us it's possible to have loss of function in the orbital cortex and a clutch of these dangerous genes and not be violent at all. They have to be triggered. And it seems that these triggers, this third factor, can be found in childhood experiences. Look at it this way. Imagine this wood and the paper as a defective brain with its loss of function in the prefrontal cortex. And imagine this petrol as the aggressive genes. Now this is a potentially lethal combination. But it's not enough on its own. It still needs a spark to ignite it. And all the evidence is suggesting that that can come from an aggressive and abusive childhood. But how might this fusion of nature and nurture actually ignite the flames of psychopathy? What's going on? Well, a new area of research that can help us here is epigenetics. Epigenetics literally means above genetics. It's about changes in the expression of genes that don't involve changes in the underlying DNA sequence. Each of our cells contain our DNA, the blueprint of our genetic code. But these cells need instructions, where to go, what to do, whether to be on or off. And they get them from compounds called methyl groups and from proteins called histones around which DNA wraps itself. And this controls how genes are expressed. So look at it this way. Imagine our script as the DNA. The words and letters are all there in the same order. They just are. And imagine epigenetics as highlighting parts of the text. So we can't change the DNA but we can change the way it's expressed. The way it's expressed. The way it's expressed. The way it's expressed. And that's what epigenetics is all about. And it explores how external environmental factors intervene in this process and can turn genes on and off and change how cells read them. And behavioral epigenetics, as the name suggests, is the study of how this process affects how we think, feel and act. In effect, how nurture can shape nature.
my own personal experience and then really reading about it further, my idea that it was 90% genes, nature, and 10% nurture, right, environment. You know, and then I, and I, I, I kind of softened that position. But now we know through epigenetics how this happens, right? How environment can change the way the genes are expressed. You don't change the genes that are there, but you change whether they're on or off, right? For example, rats have a gene called the glucocorticoid receptor, or GR, which when read, helps the rat cope with stressful situations. Now, when the rat's born, the GR is surrounded by epigenetic marks that effectively turn it off. But extensive licking and nurturing by the mother rat in the first week of her pup's life releases the neurotransmitter oxytocin, which helps to remove these marks and turns the gene back on and it stays on. However, if a rat mother doesn't lick her pups, the receptor remains turned off. Well, there you have it. You've got to lick your kids. Well, you know what we mean. This research is still in its early stages, but evidence is mounting of the epigenetic links between nature, nurture and aggression. And this is an area of research Jim Fallon is keen to encourage. If I talk about this, maybe we can um interest more people in going to research on how genes and environment interact and how it affects not only personal violence one against another but also a societal violence and gang wars all sorts of behaviors that are quite violent and negative and so that's what I'm doing now that's where it's brought me but I didn't start that way as a scientist so the Jim Fallon story and the study of epigenetics not only gives us a new and very different interpretation of the age-old nature-nurture debate. It also gives us a new angle on, a different way of looking at what from Freud onwards is one of the longest running questions in psychology. Can what happens to us in early childhood send us in one direction or another? <laughs>